everyone, we're the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Hinson. I'm Dr. Donnelly. And we are here with our continuing coverage of Netflix's The Crown. Today we are talking about episode six, Vergangenheit. She practiced that. Aren't you proud of her? Because I am. I, I can't Because I was like, what? Long German what? word. Long, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but that's how, like, phonetically I'm going to say it. Um, and you're welcome. I also looked up what it means, and it means the pa like past or history, mm -hmm. like a journey to the past. Uh, we're seeing Anastasia later today. Whatever day you're watching this, just know that we, we have already seen Anastasia. We are our most joyful uh, at this moment as we're waiting to see Anastasia. So it means the past, and is apropos given what the episode is about, and we take a journey into the past at the start of the episode to the end of the Second World War where there are some German uh, officers running about trying to save documents uh, and and they do and then the Americans show up. I don't really remember that much of the episode at the beginning um, but we see these... Because it gets so good. <laughs> I've kind of blanked this out but we see some super like top secret documents getting saved. Mm -hmm. Um... And then we see uh, that Churchill uh, goes to King George. We're flashing back and is like, the, some of these documents concern your brother. So they make th we find out that they make this pact to hide these documents from the public. So that was in 1945. Flash forward to where we are now in 1958. Um, and Elizabeth receives a letter from the aforementioned David Duke of Windsor uh, asking yes. to come back. Uh, to find employment in the UK. Uh, she agrees, and so he comes back and sh starts to, like, gather all of his friends. Like, we people that love him. The small list. Yeah, it's not a lot of people. Um, but concurrently to this, uh, some historians in a research institution in the US find this box of uh, papers in an archive, and they start reading them, and they go, holy crap, the Duke of Windsor's a Nazi! The Duke of Windsor's a Nazi! Um, that's a big deal. People should probably know that. Because, you know, he was king for a little bit, and then after that, he was still a member of the royal family and was, like, hanging out with Nazis. Um, so that becomes a really, really big deal. Uh, the Prime Minister comes to the Queen... Uh, and he and the Queen Mother, like, explained to Elizabeth, like, me surprise! Um, the United States and a bunch of other countries want to publish these documents. Which, like, of course they do. Which would explode the monarchy. Like, it would, I don't like to use violent language, but it would put a, place a bomb in the middle of the royal family. Yeah, and, and that would be it. That would be it. Um, so, uh, the Queen talks to the Duke of Windsor, brings him in, and is like, you know, how can I help you? What do you want? And he's like, oh, I just want these three jobs. And he gives her the jobs, and she's like, oh, maybe it's time to forgive him. You know, I think this might be, this might be a good idea. Uh, and Philip comes in and is like, full stop, not a good Absolutely idea. Absolutely not. No, no, Not no, a no, good no. idea. And he was like, before you make another decision, I need you to go talk to Tommy Lassels. And she rightfully says, which we're all kind of tired of seeing him, like, I can't keep running to Tommy Lassels every time I have a problem. And he was like, no, you can. Yeah, and on, th on matters of state, you're supposed to. Go see him. Because he, we find out that Tommy Lassels was Duke of Windsor's private secretary when he was King... Someone. Ed Edward? Yes, I think Edward. Edward. Um, for a year or whatever. So he was like, he, he was in the know. So she goes to see Tommy at his estate, uh, and sits down and says, I'm thinking of forgiving the Duke of Windsor and giving him a jog. What say you? And he goes, Rrr. Hard pass. That's hard. a hard pass, your majesty. So begins to talk some more about what was in these papers that was not revealed originally from the prime minister and the queen mother. Uh, and basically say, like, look, he, he visited he visited the Nazis, he talked to the Nazis, he agreed with... He toured early stage concentration camps. Yeah. He like, potentially um, endorsed the Blitz, Blitz of, of London. Of, of London, um, because he thought the expediency of bombing the shit out of London would... Would lead to surrender. Would lead to peace. 
Um, yeah. And then they had a plan to essentially once once Germany invaded Britain, they would prop they would they would take out Elizabeth's father and put and put Edward back on the throne as a Nazi king. We're, the show isn't making this up. We're not making this like, up. Google the Marburg files and yeah. have some fun. Um, Him yeah. and Wallace, very close with Adolf. Very close with the Nazis. So that's the big shock of this episode. I remember the first time I watched it and I was just gobsmacked. It was like the time that I watched that Scientology documentary and I just spent the whole time like, that was me at the end of this episode. At the end of the episode, lest you think this was some fictional uh, imaginings or exaggerations, they just show you clips of the Duke, pictures of the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson and Wallace Simpson greeting Hitler, touring Nazi like wa- walking in front of Nazi troops. My fa- one of my favorite lines in the episode is that when David is defending himself to yeah. Elizabeth, he goes, "There was no way to know what he was going to become," and I was like. I, I was sitting in an, an adjacent room from where we were sitting right now, and I just cursed so loudly. I was like, that is the biggest crock of crap I've ever heard. You went to concentration camps. You numpty. You like, went to, it's not like they built the gas they chambers were, after you were there. Like Also, they were never secret about their plans. Yeah. So anyone who tells me we couldn't have known, I have no patience for it. Like, yeah. no, 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 no. Hitler was clear. He wanted to exterminate people. Yeah, and he was like, oh, we had no idea what he would become. And he's, like, referencing no. his relationship with him in the 1920s. I was like, no, Hitler started speaking out in the early 1920s. About exterminating Jews. Early 1920s. While your father was still king. Don't give me this nonsense. Like, spoiler alert, anyone starts talking about exterminating people, putting them in cages, um, starts stripping people of their humanity, you want to give them a hard pass. Big time. You want to give them a hard pass. So that's the massive news of this. Uh, the queen brings her uncle back in and is like... And Clara Foy earns her Emmy. Oh, she is like, you can see, vibrating. Vibrating with anger. Vibrating it was with amazing. rage. Amazing. Uh, it's a, like one of the best scenes of this entire series. She earns 18 Emmys as far as I'm concerned. Um... And just flat out tells him, like, no, I, I've decided, I considered everything, and I've decided not to give you a job. And also, your continued presence in the UK is at the pleasure of of the monarchy. And I am disinclined to continue your invitation. I was like, <laughs> damn. It was so good. Amazing. But, and her version of the mic drop, which is to press the little buzzer next to her. She's like, and, uh, and, and you we're are dismissed. done now. Yeah. And we're done now. Uh, which leads to a hilarious scene at the end. God, where with Philip, it was so Philip, good. Philip comes in. He's drunk. drunk. And she's like, oh, you're drunk. And he was he's like, like, no, yeah, but wait, who I got drunk with? You don't know who I was drunk with. And she was like, what are you talking about? Uh, your, your mother. And Tommy <laughs> Lasswells, which I would have paid all the money I make in a year to sit in on that drinking session. Oh, 100%. 100%. To be on the wall. Uh, and they were all celebrating Elizabeth's... Badassery. Banishing. Uh, like, sending the devil back to hell, I yeah. think Philip said. Yeah. And she was like, oh, I'm not sure it was the Christian thing to do, which we'll get to. Dr. Donnelly's gonna talk when I'm done about Billy Graham, which was also a really big part of this episode. So she's not sure it's the Christian thing to do. And he's like, oh, on the contrary. <laughs> you stood up for your family. You stood up for your country. And he was like, that's a gold star from Jesus, which might be one of the best lines. It is a gold star from the show. Jesus. It's a gold star from Jesus. And it's a gold star from me, which reminded Dr. Donnelly and I both of one of our beloved UK shows, Pointless, that ends with the two hosts always saying, it's goodbye from Richard. It's goodbye from Richard. Richard goes, goodbye. goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. goodbye. Um, so, it's a gold star from Jesus, it's a gold star, star from me. from me. Um, and then, of course, he, like, turns the light out and jumps in, which is the only appropriate yeah. reaction to how awesome she was. It was amazing. He was so turned on, it was adorable. And it was so, ha- like, proud of her and everything. Yeah, it, was it was so amazing. great. It was really, really great. Yeah. And that's when, like, whoa, Philip. You have goodness in you. Oh, redeemed. Um, but the other really fascinating part of this whole episode is the visit, the royal visit of Billy Graham. In the show, they pretend this is the first one, but the first royal visit, well, I mean, it probably was, but they Mm -hmm. fast forwarded it. So the first royal visit was actually 1955. Oh, okay. So, um, but I, but then this is 58, we're in 58, so. um, Whatever. Yeah. They mixed up a little. Yes. So in this, 
Billy Graham comes to visit the UK and he's touring the UK and the Queen invites him uh, to, to give visit. a private sermon, a Sunday morning sermon at Windsor Castle. Yes, and to visit her. So I would love to turn this over to our resident religious scholar, Dr. Donnelly. Please tell me who Billy Graham was, why he was important, and what his relationship with the Queen was. And wh like what I loved about this episode was we get an insight into the Queen's faith. Which is really, really strong. Which is really strong uh, and really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So take it away. So first of all, <clears throat> Billy Graham is was, he passed away earlier this year. Yes, earlier this year. Yes. Um, I think he was 99. Lived a big old life, our Billy. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, he was probably the preeminent American evangelist. So the very first American evangelist was a guy named Billy Sunday. And he took over the radio waves in the early 20th was his century. his last name really Sunday? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and then there was another guy named Dwight Moody, who you may know if you've ever been to Chicago, and there's a big Moody Bible Institute there. So they were the they were his predecessors, and they took to the airwaves of the radio, and they did massive outdoor revivals. It was a huge deal. Billy did that, but on television. So after World War II, when the world is completely upended, no one knows what's going on anymore, everything's really, really complicated. Billy, who's an ordained Baptist preacher from North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte, with a really, really, really excellent oratory skill and a way to distill things down to black and white now. Footnote. Pin. This is always going to be my problem with Billy Graham's public professions of faith is that he does distill it down to really black and white stuff. And for me, the Christian faith is so much more complicated and beautiful than he kind of ever gives it quite credit for. Um, and it is also why I will not... His son, Franklin Graham, you may have heard of, is a very fundamentalist and says opens his mouth a lot about politics. Um, and Franklin Graham and I cannot ever see eye to eye. I see a little, I'm a little bit more of a Venn diagram with some of Billy's stuff, um, mm -hmm. especially with his intentions of what he was trying to do. Um, again, because it was the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and the world was very different. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I am somebody, in full disclosure, if you've never watched one of my religious rants before, who tries to give people a lot of grace for who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I don't try to, I, so that's a huge thing. There's a lot of my contemporaries who don't have any time for Billy Graham. I understand his place in American history. So in this time where everything's really confusing, this lovely, kind, passionate, and yet you can tell he's kind of, you can tell he's kind. Like he's not, he's certainly up there yelling and, and, and very, very passionately proclaiming his message, but he's not quite being a jerk about it in the same way that people may have seen before. Like, yeah. he just very clearly loves you so much he wants you to believe this. And I think that genuineness from what I've seen comes across a lot more than some more popular televangelists yeah. now that people might be familiar Correct. with. Correct, like Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen, Osteen who come across very disingenuous. Slick. Yeah. So, so this is before, yeah. yeah, so he wasn't fundraising for anything. Billy Graham did massive crusades. He sold out Yankee Stadium in the 50s, 60s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. I know none of them. They that. were um, usually televised on PBS, at least, if they were not televised on anything else. I remember watching Billy Graham crusades with my grandmother in the late 80s in North Jersey on the television. Um, and his message is simple. Jesus loves you, but you are a sinner. And you must repent of that. We're all sinners. And we all must repent of that sin. And you must pray and ask Jesus into your heart to become your personal savior. That sounds, that might sound very simple to you because there's millions and millions and millions of people who have stopped you on street corners or in your pulpits, or perhaps you believe that yeah. when he was doing it in the fifties, evangelicalism has been around since the mid 1800s post civil war, but it really hit its stride after world war II. Um, and so this was the first time it was mass media. Mm -hmm. This is the first time, I mean, like you're watching your little black and white television and it's Howdy Doody or Billy Graham. Like these are the kind of options. And he became America's evangelist, um, and really set up the even the evangelical Christian movement for the next 70 years. Um, it is very, um, it's a very black and white faith. It's, and it's one entirely based on personal piety. So your belief system isn't necessarily attached to the church that you grew up in. It's not attached to the way your parents raised you. It's attached to a personal decision that you make to follow the teachings and disciplines of Christ. 
So when you break that all down, that's a really big deal. Like you're not just, a, I mean, and so we get all these really trite phrases out of it now. Like you're, you're not a, like a car isn't magic just because it sits in a garage and a person isn't a Christian is because they go to church. Like that's all those kind of very trite things that come out in the eighties and nineties um, of the mass market of evangelicalism that I've talked about before, especially with Handmaid's Tale in our recap videos of that. Um, but this very like, Hey, by the way, the world is, the world is an absolute dumpster fire. There are all these people on both sides of our country who are trying to kill us. They're getting more and more stories about Hitler and what he did. P refugees, Nazi refugees are coming to America and telling stories. Yeah. We've just placed Japanese Americans in cages. And at this stage, and we are... Everything in, is chaos. ...involved heavily in the Korean War. And no one knows why, really, uh, or what's going on, or anything. Yeah. The world is very, very complicated, and there is this lovely attractive, yeah, well-spoken yeah. I mean, man who stands up on television and says, hey, God knows what's going on. You may be really confused, but here's the good... And it, and it's a very... The, the faith of Billy Graham is very non-judgmental. Like, it, it, evangelical preachers like Joel Osteen and, and Benny Hinn and some other ones like that, and I would even say, like, John Piper, who, who some people watching this will know, have turned this kind of very strong, straight message of we're all sinners into a much more judgmental stance. Mm, yeah. Early Billy Graham was not. It was much more egalitarian. Hey, listen, we're all dumpster fires. Yeah. We are all awful people. You know that the things that you're super ashamed about at, after, like, at night? God knows those, and he loves you anyway. Yeah. And so he just became the voice of the people, and he became international. So that's why he was important. And he started coming. England and um, America have much more strong religious connections than a lot of people realize, especially in evangelicalism. So he started doing crusades in Britain as well in 55, and he went back a lot. So the important thing for this episode is his relationship with Queen Elizabeth. Fascinating. And she, like, she, you can see during this private sermon that she very much connects with the simplicity of his message. Yeah. Um, and the the universality of it, mm -hmm. that we're all human and that we're all sinners. And it, it, fascinating when, she, when he comes to have a private uh, audience with her and to have tea. And that's one of the things she says to him. And she goes, during your sermon, I really felt like... I was just a simple Christian. I was just a simple Christian. And it's a beautiful line just to, you know, that there was something in her life that would remind her of her own humanity. Mm -hmm. Even when she is, you know, and she tells him, she goes, it's, it's, it's in my life. I don't really feel like, you know, there's anyone speaking to me or sermonizing to me because I'm the head of the Anglican church. So the only person above me is God. And he says, that must be lonely. That must be lonely. And she says it is. And I'm so, sure that's the first time she's ever said those words out loud to anybody yeah, either. And yeah. like, I mean, on a much smaller scale, all my friends who are pastors talk about this phenomenon that like having somebody else speak to you as not the pastor, <laughs> like being able to sit in somebody else's congregation is a really holy experience. So I'm not surprised that's how Elizabeth feels. Also, for anyone who doesn't know, Elizabeth is an incredibly strong Christian. Um, it is a central tenet of her entire life. Um, she has talked about it extensively in her Christmas sermons. Every pastor and religious person who has ever met with her talks about it. President Obama has talked about it. One of the conversations that is that has been disclosed from times where President Obama and the Queen were together was, in fact, about Africa. She had questions about black spirituality and African-American churches in America and how they were different. Wow. She is incredibly well-knowledged, as far as we know, about world religions and why different, different people believe different things. Um, so, but there's a lot of things we don't know because, um, two things. One, the queen's never going to disclose private conversations ever. Nope. We also don't, I mean, even though because of the Billy Graham rule where he was never in a room alone, he's never in a room alone with a woman because sexism in Christianity. Um, it's, it's highly unlikely that they were alone for these things. It would, it, at least Martin was in the room, most likely. Her private secretary was in the room. But... Billy Graham also, after after a meeting with Truman, President Truman, where he disclosed the contents of the meeting and Truman excommunicated him from the White House, <laughs> um, Billy Graham swore never again to ever disclose Whoops. the contents of, of a meeting with the head of state. And so all he says in his biography, Just As I Am, which is written in the 90s, I believe, so he's in his 70s at this point um, when he writes this book, is that, you know, good manners prevent me from disclosing but um, that he found a lot of, of lovely things about Her Majesty. And yeah. that she was intelligent and, and very well-versed and, and a very 
solid, kind Christian. All of these things we believe. Yeah. And uh, so he preached the Easter sermon at Windsor Castle in 1995. She knighted him in 2001. Um, we we don't think they were pen pals because she's probably not pen pals with anybody, especially after Margaret disclosed some of her letters in the 80s. Um so she's not pen pals with anybody, but there's a lot of evidence that every time he was he was in the UK, they had they had time together and he preached a sermon at Windsor. This is a really big deal too ecumenically, by the way, because he's one of only a handful of people who are not ordained Anglican ministers who preached at the private family chapel in Windsor. Wow. So he is Baptist, which is a free church movement. Um he, he never, ever preached membership of a specific church, which is also something that was very different about him at the time. Um, he was very much about you and your relationship with Jesus. And because the queen can't do anything else, her discipleship is entirely, she has to take it entirely on herself. Yeah, I can see how holy that was. So then the thing that I want to ramble on just a little bit more. <laughs> she's is, going folks she's is going this to concept of forgiveness so we're going to link to a couple things in the show notes where other religious reporters especially sarah pullen bailey at the washington post kind of talk about the authenticity of this episode they fact check this episode and very famously this episode is the one where they talk about forgiveness mm -hmm. because the queen has to figure out if she can ever forgive her uncle and she brings him back she brings billy graham back after she's met with tommy lassell's uh, and after she has made, uh, and she's struggling with this decision about what to do with him, uh, and, and asks specifically about forgiveness with Billy Graham. So it's fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, the Christian position of forgiveness is that we have to forgive everyone because Christ forgave us for worse things forever. And he's forgiven everyone already. So why are we better than Jesus to not forgive them? That's the official Christian tenet across all denominations. The, the unofficial one is that it's really hard. And really, no one really knows how to do it. And it's a very personal journey. So the thing, the difference, and there's lots of, lots and lots of things like forgiveness versus do, does repentance of the other person need to precede your forgiveness? I mean, people have written theses on this. But what it boils down to is that just because you forgive someone does not mean you ever need to let them back into your life. And all you're really doing when you forgive somebody is kind of like releasing the bitterness in your heart. This can take this can take millennia. This can take a long time. It can take seven seconds. Like, so all Billy Graham, if you're watching this and wondering really what he's saying, all he's saying is that as a human being, Elizabeth Windsor needs to give up her anger because it's going to eat her alive. Yeah. As the Queen of England, she has no need to go back on her word. Yeah, or to keep the Duke of Windsor in her life. Ever. Ever. No. No. Forgiveness does not mean a restoration of the relationship. Absolutely not. No. So, and that's the thing. He doesn't really say that, but that in all of other Billy Graham's theology, I mean, that's, it's pretty clear. He never advocated for people to be in a relationship with people who were abusive to them. Like he never advocated for that. He was a big advocate and theologically Baptists are as well, that forgiveness is a whole lot more about you. Restoration requires repentance. Forgiveness is just, you give up their, their power over your life and you go, you know what? That was awful. They're probably an awful person. I'm moving on. Again, that can take decades. That might need therapy. That can be a massive thing. There are people that go to their grave without forgiving people. And theologically, I will tell you, I don't think God cares as much as a lot of other people think they do. But I will tell you, I think the thing that she, how she handled the Duke of Windsor is actually the most Christian thing she could have done. Mm -hmm. I agree with Philip, um, which I will never say again. <laughs> so you don't know that. Um, I agree with Philip because a huge part of Christian responsibility and her and her understanding of her role in this world is as a protector. And we are, as Christians, very concerned with justice and very concerned with equity and very concerned with a lot of things. If she had overlooked the fact that he tried to destroy people, was an active participant in the extermination of a race. Who's, and whose actions were, the res were responsible for possibly... The destruction of British property and the death, the of, death British, of, of, of innocence of British citizens. Like, it, yes. And then he sat there the and said, the you Jews, don't understand like, how hard my life was. The Nazis attacked their people, her constituents, Yep, her people Yeah, that she has been charged, anointed by God, anointed by God to, protect. to protect. That is a big, 
deal. So if he had sat there and broke down weeping and talked about what an incredible mistake it was, oh, this would have been a different conversation. She could have forgiven him. She probably would have said, let's go on television. Let's talk about it. We can do this. I mean, she probably wouldn't have, but he, like... He effectively stood there and was like, you know what? It, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Nazis aren't bad people. No. What? Nazis. No. The, Nazi the, the Nazi ideology is atrocious and damaging. Always. There is the door. Always bad people. So, one of the very first dictums that, that we get in the Old Testament is from Micah 6, 8, and it is, Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that is exactly what Elizabeth did in this episode. And as far as we can tell, has attempted to do for most of her life. Yeah. And so I, I understand why she feels so lonely. And I'm really glad that in this particular historical episode, she did have somebody as gentle and as learned and as calm as Reverend Graham. Because there are certainly people in the historical oeuvre of Anglicanism at this time that would not have been as good counsel for her. Those so, archbishops don't seem like decent dudes. I don't really. The, one, the, the last couple have been lovely. The, one, the one that we see in some of these episodes. Not so great. Wrong. Currently, like, okay I mean, dudes. Okay, dudes. okay dudes. Previously, less okay. Um, but she had a she had a pastor. Yeah. And she needed a pastor. And that's what, I mean, we all need mentors. And that's what, for Christians, that's what a pastor is. It's somebody who you can just say, I think I might be screwing this up. And the pastor could go, well, you might be, but let's talk about some other wisdom. Let's let's talk it out. Um, and I really do appreciate, too, that Billy Graham took his pastoral privilege really seriously with her. Mm -hmm. That we have all evidence of that. That somebody was kind to her. Yeah, and I mean, we've talked about this in our other recaps, right? That's what we are looking for is some sort of person to bring Elizabeth into conversations and it's and to show us freaking ground to show us her humanness and mm -hmm. that she struggles with things and you know we were like give her an internal monologue mm -hmm. give her a diary like give her some sort of plot device so that we can see Elizabeth develop and that's what what was so impactful about this episode and the previous episode really yeah. um uh, about the the guy with the article that changes the monarchy that we get to see they found devices to bring her out. Yeah. So hopefully this is a trend continuing for the episodes. Something tells me we have a lot more Margaret to do, but in this season. But that was fascinating. Wow. What a wealth of knowledge. I knew, obviously, as the heathen of the two of us, I know nothing of these things or very little. Um, so I, I love the historical background and understanding why, because I knew who Billy Graham was, like even growing up culturally, but understanding his significance within the evangelical movement and how it all got started and how very much to what we're seeing in this show, reactions to the Second World War, which as, you know, we're both in our mid thirties, we only ever learned about it um, through history, understanding what it must have been like, especially for a lot of these people who have lived through two world wars, which mm -hmm. I can't fathom what that would have felt like, mm -hmm. uh, to think that you had survived the great war and then to have another one like 30 years later. Religion is always an institution and it's always a cultural movement. Faith yeah. is different, but religion is always an institution. So it always reacts to culture always. So if you're curious about why a group of Christians did X, Y, Z at this point in history, look at what else is happening around the world. There's always an answer. Yeah. So for that very detailed analysis of Vergangenheit. Sorry guys. No, don't apologize. I'm sure it was what everyone is going to enjoy it as much as I did while I was sitting here. Uh, but that's all we have for episode six. We'll be back for episode seven, but for now we leave you I am Dr. Hinson. And I'm Dr. Donnelly. We're the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.